A very good morning and welcome to our meeting this morning. It's really a privilege that we can spend some time with the Word of God. And my prayer is that you will be blessed today uh, so that we can bring glory to God. And um, if you want to give this message um, a name, you can call it the burning bush. What? The burning bush. The burning bush. Yes. Um, and I uh, want to bring your attention to Luke 19, verse 1 to 10, and I'm going to read it. Uh, then Jesus entered uh, and passed through Jericho. Now, behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd for he was of a short statue. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and come down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, 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 I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So this is a very interesting story if we look at what Zacchaeus did. And uh, we see there a very, very important word, and that is sought. <laughs> he was sought out, Jesus. It gives me the impression that he was, he had a passion <laughs> to see who Jesus is. He made every effort to, to be able to see Jesus. And yes, sometimes we, we uh, people say to short people, shorty. <laughs> so I'm glad nobody called me shorty <laughs> because of my short stature. Yes, so um, that sycamore tree, actually, the use of the sycamore tree in those days, they made coffins out of that. So um, Zacchaeus, when he heard the voice of Jesus, he made haste. He didn't ask anything. He didn't ask, oh, you talk to me. But because Jesus was looked up, uh, but he came hastily. It's another word. So we see he first sought Jesus, and then he make haste to come down from this tree. Because we cannot uh, uh, take too much time in the sycamore tree. Uh, otherwise, maybe people will make a coffin for us. And now I also spoke speak spiritual about that. When we stay too long in one position, we, be, we, we can get to the place that we die in our spirit. So uh, we see here this passion that Zacchaeus to see Jesus. And then when Jesus spoke, I, 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 it reminds me now about uh, uh, Lazarus when he was in the grave and he heard the voice of Jesus, he came out. They didn't wait an hour or two for him to come down. He came out immediately. So, uh, and that when we hear the voice of God, we must move quickly, especially when you know, now God spoke to me. Don't ask questions and don't uh, 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 delay that because then the, the, the soul will get in and then you will start to, 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 to argue it with yourself. 
So don't go that way. If you you know that God is speaking to you, do it immediately. What I do, when especially when we go on holiday, and then I pack all my my things, and then I'm in bed, and then I think, oh, I didn't take that. I get out of bed and I do it. <laughs> because I learn in my life, it's easy to forget something. But now when that happened, uh, 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 then there was this complaining. So we know that when we sought Jesus out, and we heard his voice, there will be accusations and all kinds of things. Listen what they say. He said, look, uh, he said, he has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. So they, they was not, I mean, if we know there's a sinner that comes to Jesus, we are so excited. Now they complain about that. And I didn't say who complained, but I can guess it's the Pharisees and the scribes, the, the religious leaders in those days. So they are still with us. They are still with us. And they maybe have accusations against us when we saw Jesus out and when we hear him, we act on that. But listen what Zacchaeus, you know this guy, and then he said, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I take anything, uh, uh, anyone by false accusation, I will restore it fourfold. Can you see his, his passion for the Lord? He wants to make things straight with the Lord. So he is willing to give half of what he have away, and even he will say, I will, I will restore it fourfold. Listen what Jesus said. Today, salvation has come to this house. Now, our question can be, if a person is not so uh, desire Jesus and there's no action, is that person really sought Jesus out? But now Jesus said, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to say which was lost. That is a very important scripture. So uh, when we look at these things, that is, he said, can you see the way that he made it straight? He did not repent. In a, in, a, in a way, he repented because he said, if I took everything, I will give fourfold and I will give half. But he did not really repent and say, oh, um, I, I, I repent about this sin and this sin and that sin. And he was totally in that moment focused on Jesus and what will please Jesus. And when we can quickly investigate what Jesus was saying here, what which was lost. What was killed when, Jesus, when Adam and Eve sinned? We will talk about that. And this word lost actually means in, in um, the Greek is apolumi. Uh, it's a P U L L U M I. That is lost. A P O L L U M I. Now this word in the entire dictionary said to destroy, to put out of the way entirely, abolish, put an end to ruin, render useless, or to kill, to declare that one must be put to death. Metaphorically, to devote or give over to eternal misery in hell, to perish, to be lost, to ruined or destroyed. But when we read this very carefully, it said Jesus, Jesus did not say those who were lost, but which was lost. There's a, a big difference. So he was not talking about a per people because then he will say those. But he said, which? 
So if, when we read in Genesis 3, verse 22 and 23, it says, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. Now, uh, um, the whole rest, we know that for a, a, a time being, God was looking for a man that can restore that because uh, Adam and Eve was, uh, uh, um, uh, was chased out of, the, 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 out of Eden and then Jesus, uh, God sent the Son to reconcile us because he's actually somebody that is without sin that can. And we know when Jesus was on, on earth, he was 100% he was man, but also 100% God. But he died as 100% man. He did not die as God because it was man who sinned. You understand that? So, um, what would happen if they stayed in the garden after they ate the forbidden fruit? And they stay in the garden and they eat from the tree of life we would be doomed because then they would live forever with sin and there would be no way to get rid of the sin. So therefore to protect man, God let him go out and he put an angel there with a sword. We would never be reconciled to God again. So I hope you can see God's grace in this whole story, why he chased out man out of the garden. So, and in Genesis 1 verse 27 and 28, it said, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, what did God actually give to, to Adam and Eve? He said that they carry the image and the likeness of God and that they must, must be fruitful to carry the likeness and the image of God. Now, when we talk about likeness and image, mean that God imputed into us the character and his nature. That is what image and likeness mean. We have the character of God and we also have his nature. And we know that his nature is in his in his name when we say i pray in the name it means it's the nature and please keep this in the back of your mind while we journey this morning to these very two important narratives i gave you the first uh, narrative now i'm going to give you another one that is a little uh no, it's not that long it's not oh, long, is it? Yeah, that is that is yeah, that is what a God mm -hmm. is going to do when we are following in his footsteps. But let us look to the next uh, narrative is in Exodus 3 verse 1 to 15. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire 
from the midst of a bush. So he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that uh, he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Israel, and the God of Jacob. I, uh, sorry, God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Parasites and the Hevites and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you might bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So he said, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God, and his mount uh, uh, on this mountain. Then Mo Moses said to God, Indeed, when I came to the children of Israel and said to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they said to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abram, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. Now in this narrative, we read that Moses was busy with his daily task in the back of the desert, and he saw this interesting phenomena in the nature because he said, he look and he see that. And, but can you see what luck here, what was in with, with uh, Zacchaeus? That passion, that passion. It was, he said, oh, that's a strange thing that happened. Let me have a look. He, he, there was not this zeal to see, oh my goodness, what is going on? I must go and see what is going on. Uh, so um, he was, it was for me, if he was a little bit of passive. He was not, there was not a zeal uh, in that. <clears throat> and he saw this burning, this fire in this bush. And then God started speaking to him. But he didn't say, yes, Lord, I will go, because you said you will go with me. Yes, let's go. But you know what? What shall I say to the people? Can you see the difference between these two people? Zacchaeus couldn't wait to get out of that tree. <coughs> and it gives me the impression he's so, he's so scared he was going to miss something. Now, here we see these two different people reacting to what, what is busy going on. And then we know, and later, later in the story, 
that Moses also bring excuses. Mm. Oh, I cannot talk. You know, it's even if I can hear, I was like that when I heard, why don't you start your own household? Oh, God didn't tell me to do that. <laughs> can you hear my excuse? <laughs> So, um, yeah, we see that, um, and we see that in, in Luke, Zacchaeus' reaction was, I will give, I will give. Now, uh, we do not read that Abram give any, uh, it was uh, Abram at this stage, he didn't give anything, it was only complaints and questions and things like that. So we see that two kinds of people, those who postpone all the time, I will do it later, you know, maybe next year or maybe the year after that. <clears throat> now we can ask ourselves, in which category do I fit? Do I fit with Zacchaeus, where he was in the tree and Jesus said, come down, or will I be like Moses? Oh, you know, Lord, um, it sounds a little bit difficult for me. You know what? I have all these challenges in my life. You know, because that will uh, uh, that will give also the passion here in your heart that builds you up. Yes, Lord. I think about when they went into, when the spies was uh, uh, sending out to the promised land and they came back and ten said, oh, it's a beautiful land. And look at this fruit, because only two people have to, to carry the, the grape, so big it was. And, and then, uh, and they said, but we look like grasshoppers. Can, can, can you sense that immediately this thing that push you down? Caleb said, no, 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 we can take it, let's go, <laughs> you know, that that do something inside of us when we have this, uh, you know, let's go. Now, we cannot try to be like Zacchaeus. We cannot try to, to, to be active because then there's nothing, it, it must come from inside, is the thing that God place into your heart to be zealous to pursue Christ to sort Christ <laughs> you know like Zacchaeus and when we hear the voice of God and that enlight this fire into your heart and it's actually because we know the, the mind is the heart is actually in your spirit that you experience this this fire that starts burning inside you it's like this burning bush it draws you you can try to stop it but it's not working because this drawing of god is so powerful you have to do it there's no ways that you can say Oh, let me wait a little bit and see what's going on. I wonder why. No, it, this thing, it's overwhelm you. And it's all that is in your mind, this drawing of the Lord, when you hear his voice, when you hear his voice or he show you something like this burning bush, it draws you, it draws. You know, when you light the candle um, in the night or there's a light, the, the moths and all a kind of insects flew to that light. It's drawing that. It's that drawing that you cannot ignore. You cannot ignore it. You have to do it. <laughs> you, you actually feel if I'm not doing, I'm going to die. I have to do this. I must get closer. I must get closer. So, um, so, but, but sadly, many don't have this inner desire, this to sort Jesus with, with, with every power, every uh, thing that is in them. So, if we 
do not have this desire. Now, I don't say if you still in a place where you captured for many years at the cross, you become uh, a, a halfway paralyzed because you are so used to, I'm a Christian and I am so happy where I am, that you're going, there was a, a TV program going slowly nowhere. That is actually, you're going slowly in nowhere. So that is not our problem. But when we hear God's voice, something comes alive in you that you want to get up from this, uh, 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 what is the word that I can use, in a paralyzed state and you want to move up. And at that stage, you, you feel you can change the whole world <laughs> at that stage. But we know it's not that easy because uh, people, God must also first touch other people's hearts to become alive, to start sorting out Jesus, sorting out Jesus. And the problem is not that you paralyze. The problem, the problem is what are you going to do about it? And the Bible said to us in Matthew 7, if you seek and you knock, you will find. If you seek, you will find. So what must you do? You must ask, Lord, give me this passion. Give me this power. Give me this fire. I want to go after you. I want to sort you out. Because when you sort Jesus out and he start working with you, guess what's going to happen with you? Other people will start sorting out you. Not you as the person, but that what is in you. They want that fire of God inside of you. And we know the day of Pentecost that the Holy Spirit manifests in a flame. <clears throat> so we cannot try to start this flame, but there is a flame. When we're born again, there is a flame. Then we may say, Lord, you must blow on this flame. I want to be, be I want to be so... Uh, Jesus said, if, because you are not hot of, or cold, that you lukewarm. So when you lukewarm, Jesus said, I will spew you out of my mouth. But when you are, uh, 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 I was thinking about, if you can send me a picture that show me your love for God, what would that picture be? I find one in, 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 in the emojis that, some of that, but uh, in that, that I saw this heart with a flame oh, yeah. in. Yeah. That yeah. is for me, that even if it's only a little flame, yeah. then you can say, Lord, blow on this flame. Mm -hmm. Blow on this flame, Holy Spirit, blow it on. I want to be on fire for God. Uh, so, yeah. But uh, let us look a little bit about to be paralyzed. Uh, what is a reason why we have this, that we paralyzed? We can read it in Job 1 verse 10. Uh, have you not made a hedge around him, Satan said to God, when God asked him, you saw my, my, my uh, servant Job? He's upright, there's no one in his generation like him. Um, then uh, 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 Satan said, have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, around his household, and all, uh, around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the works of his hand, and his possessions have increased in the land. Now he said, his household, it means that Everything that belongs to Job, there's a hedge around him. Even those that are paralyzed, there's a hedge around. And now Satan said, but I can don't I cannot do anything with him because there's a hedge around him. And Satan acknowledged that God put a hedge around Job. So what does that, that tell us? In the in the spirit. They can see if you have a hedge 
or you break down that hedge. And that is why we become paralyzed because our hedges are broken down. Okay. Because um, he, uh, uh, Satan said to God that everything around and all that he has on every side is in this hedge. Uh, I do not know if you know, but, but uh, when South Africa was really, uh, there was not, you know, in, in many years ago, <coughs> there was not really things that people could uh, 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 protect their cattle. So what they did, especially there in northern, northern um, South Africa, they will take uh, 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 branches from a thorn tree and they will pack it around that to keep the lions out. Now you must have this in your mind. You are in the middle and God put this hedge around you. Nothing can go out and nothing can come in. You are protected by God. So it's only when you need to go out that you can open it. But when you break that hedge, the enemy can come in and he can do with you whatever he wants. So what, what he wants us to do? He wants us to be paralyzed because then we are no good for the kingdom of God. So, and when God is doing something, the only way that God can do something is in excellence. He don't do, sometimes you know, we do things when somebody asks us, so only to do it, you know, so, so, <laughs> you know, but you don't do it with excellence because that passion is not there. And he, he left nothing outside. When he worked, he doing everything perfectly. Now that word hedge is also a shield. And that's also a wall. So that is the same word for the word hedge. It's your shield, it's your wall. Now shield, coming from the Hebrew word kanan, it's G-A-N-A-N, which means to cover, to surround, to defend, you know? And these words are interchangeable. Speaking of the covering of Christ, also of Christ surrounding and protecting his righteous one in every side. So now here we hear a word, his righteous ones. He's not going to do it for the unrighteous. You must be righteous. And that gives us actually the impression that while you are behind this hedge, you are untouchable. God is our shield and he keeps us. God gives us the promise when we keep ourselves that nothing will touch us. Let me give you the, the scripture, John 5 verse 18 to 19. We know absolutely that anyone born of God does not deliberately and knowingly practice or committing sin. But the one who was begotten of God carefully watches over and protects him. That actually means to keep himself. Then it says, Christ's divine presence within him preserve him against the evil. And the wicked one does not lay hold or get a grip on him or touch him. So why is Satan sometimes so busy in our lives? Because we break the hedge. We must make sure, because there is a scripture that said, when the wall is broken, the serpent will bite you. And then he said in verse 19, we know positively that we are of God. If you are not sure that you are of God, you must make sure. 
and the whole world around us is under the power of the evil one. So can you see again these two pictures? The one that is totally protected by God. God is the shield, the wall, the, um, the covering, uh, the surrounding, the, is your defense. But at the other hand, you are under the sway of the de devil. Can you see the two things? Now, the one, the one that is, uh, uh, the hedge is, is it, it's, it's not broken. There's, there's power, there's, uh, uh, there's desire, there's zealous for God's thing. The other one is how passive. Because God, uh, Satan had uh, a freely, entrance in that person's life and that's why we must learn to close the doors we must close the doors and the more we close the doors he must go he must go because he cannot you remember when jesus came in certain places when he was on earth when he came into that environment the, de the demons will manifest and then he said go away and some of them scream, why do you want to come and, and, and harm us or whatever? Because they cannot operate in the presence of Christ. They cannot. But we mustn't break the hedge. So we must, the presence in us uh, uh, is actually what Pre preserve us from the influence of the evil one, uh, the wicked one, and he will not lay hold grip on us because God is the wall around us. And in Genesis 15 verse 1 it says, After these things the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, Do not be afraid, Abram, I am your shield your exceedingly great reward wow the first time i read it and it opened my eyes i'm telling you sometimes <coughs> I, I i have this thing in me to say you know please help me because i cannot help myself because i'm so excited <laughs> what god is telling me it amazes me how god involves himself with us God said, I'm your shield, your exceedingly great reward. You ever receive on earth that great reward? But in the spirit, God said, I am your reward. So if we are not saying, yes, 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 give, give, give me. I want, you are my great reward. I embrace it. But said, oh, I didn't know that. And you leave it there. Now that blow my mind away that God give himself to us as a reward, as a shield. He committed himself when we come to him and give ourselves to him. He will protect us. Is that not desirable? For me it is definitely. In Ephesians 6 verse 16 said, Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiercy, fiercy darts of the wicked one. Now, what is your shield? It's your word. It's the Bible. It's Christ. That is how you must protect you with the word. And not agree with all the nonsense that the enemy sow with the seed in your mind. You must put in, uh, uh, <coughs> what, what do you call it, the things that <coughs> kill the, 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 the weeds and the things. When that, that side, you must kill that side. There and then. Don't give him any chance to sprout. You must kill that seed. You must take a thing and you must grind it that there's nothing that can grow. Because that is a thing, if we are not doing it, we will start meditating on that. So that, what it says, 
when you take your 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 shield and that we learn now that God is the hedge actually around us it gives me the impression that God stands between us and that which comes against us he stand between us you know <clears throat> If that cannot bring people to say, I want that God, because otherwise my life, I might be think it's a wonderful life, but there's something here inside you that that it's not like a, it's not like a, you don't feel good inside and it depressed you, it bring you to depression and you always angry and screaming and swearing and do all this thing. I cannot think that that is a very uh, a, a, a fruitful life. Now, and that quench this fiercy dart that the wicked one shot upon us, because God is between us and that what is coming to us, and God make a covenant a covenant with us. He is totally committed to us to be just to our protector. Our shield, he is always ready to help in the time of need. He said in Hebrews 4.16, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of Christ that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You know, people that live a, a, a worldly life, they will quote this scripture and then sometimes will say, oh, it doesn't help me to pray because God is not answering. But then is the question, are you zealous for God? Are you sorting Him? <coughs> Sorry. Absalom come against his father David, but David did not fear that. David feared nothing. He did not fear when he came against Goliath. Many times we cannot sleep because our minds are so busy with all the things we face daily. But do you know what David said? He said in Psalm 3, verse 5 to 6, I lay down and slept. I woke for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of 10,000 of people who have set themselves against me all around. So David could sleep in a storm. There was a story about this guy. He was looking for a job uh, 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 on a farm. And <coughs> this farmer said to him, <coughs> sorry, can you sleep in a storm? He said, yes, I can sleep in a storm. So after a while, this farmer woke up in the night and it's thunder and it's lightning and it's raining. And he woke up and he said, I wonder if the cattle is safe. Is the sheep safe? He got up. He saw all, everything was looking after. There was nothing to worry about. Why? Because that guy that was working for him can sleep in a storm because he knows that he did what he could to keep his master's things safe. But why could uh, David said, I lay down and I sleep? Because he knew that God will sustain him. He said, even thousands of people come against him, he will not be afraid. David also said many times that God did good with him according to God's promises, even when he sinned. <laughs> and he didn't know that he sinned. And when the prophet came and said, you the guy, he immediately repented. David knew that God age was around him. He knew God's protection surround him. David was so secure in the promises of God. We must do the same because the promises is also for us. Because the word tells us if we believe, we are also the descendants of, of Abram. So we can 
that this is also for us. But if our minds are not in line with the promises, in that what God is saying, it will never become ours. You understand? In Jeremiah 17 verse 10 said, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. Even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. We need to understand that although we are in a place being connected to grace, there is still a demand for us to, uh, to live a manner of life of practical righteousness. Looking at these scriptures, it is clear that there will come a visitation from the Lord to give to us according to our doing, which means our actions and not our intents. So when we look at ourselves, we see the intent, what we want to do. But we, when we look at others, we see the fruit of what they do. We also must look at the fruit that we produce because God is looking for fruit. You know, and the hedge is a covenantal right for the righteous. Isn't that awesome? The protective hedge is a covenant, covenant right for those who walk blameless before the Lord. Can you hear the conditions? There's conditions to the promises. God placed a hedge around those who walk blameless before him. He is our shield, our covering. This hedge was not only around Job, but also those who walk blameless before him, like Moses and Samuel and others that walk in righteousness and reverential fear. I think a lot of times why we are paralyzed and why we are not conscious actually uh, 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 in, uh, that we sin is because reverential fear lacking in our life because the reverential fear for God keep us actually from sinning uh, write the question down and then when we finish we can do that thank you very much Anita Matthew 6 verse 33 but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall add it to you. Here we see that the word said, um, we must seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Because if we are not righteous, we will not receive anything. God promises to those who are blameless and righteous that the promise belongs to those that fear the Lord. That means that we must walk in practical righteousness. God got covenant with Abram. We see in Genesis 17 with verse 1, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. And we know that the word also say, be holy because I'm holy. God made this covenant with Abram and said, walk blameless before me. That is not legalistic or a sin conscience, but a demand from God that we have to walk blameless before him. We see David in 2 Samuel 22, verse 24 and 25. I was also blameless before him, and I kept myself from my iniquity. Therefore, the Lord has recompensed my according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his eyes. David gives us a clear indication indication why he was successful so that is the the word that God actually spoke over, over David some will maybe say but that is Old Testament when David says he was blameless he kept himself from iniquity he said God recompense him according to his righteousness according to the cleanness of his eyes that is a CD, a CD that God actually gave to David. You know, I do not know what I'm going to, to do if I hear God 
hear uh, him and he said, I am Almighty God. <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to react. 2 Samuel 22 verse 26, with the mercy, with with the merciful, you will show yourself merciful. With a blameless man, you will show yourself blameless. That is in 2 Samuel. But in Romans 9 verse 15, it says, For he says that he is God, says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. The condition for God to give mercy is to be blameless according to 2 Samuel 22 verse 26 that I read. With the mercy you will show yourself merciful, with blameless man you shall show you blameless. We are in covenant with God. He will show mercy and compassion upon us because we are walking according to the conditions. God is doing it not because of that we are but who he is. Because remember when God looked to us, he see Jesus. But we must be very careful of our conduct, the way how we present ourselves. And in Hebrews 13 verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. Even that is who God is, but his way of operating can change because when he, he said he's going to 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 wipe out the nation and I, and Moses stand in the gap God didn't do that so he can change his operation he can say to this man it's the end of that person time out he didn't want to listen and that person come and said Lord forgive me God forgive that person and he's operating, it's change. But he stay the same. I hope you understand that. Um, Samuel 22, 36 to 43. You have also given me the shield of your salvation. Your gentleness has made me great. Well, you must listen carefully to these words. You enlarged my path under me, so my feet did not slip. I have pursued my enemies and destroyed them. Neither did I turn back again till they were destroyed. And I have destroyed them and wounded them so that they could not rise. They have fallen under my feet. For I have armed me with the strength for the battle. You have subdued under me those who rose against me. You have also given me the necks of my enemies so that I destroyed those who hated me. They looked, but there was none to save, even to the Lord, but he did not answer them. Then I beat them as fine as the dust of the earth. I trod them like dirt in the streets, and I spread them out. Now, <clears throat> we must remember David was doing that to his physical enemies. And we read here every time that was God that do that, that gave him the power to, to do the other. But today, this is mindset. So this mindset must be destroyed. And how do we destroy it? Through the word of God. The word is the only because by your renewing of your mind, when your mind is renewed in a certain area guess what jesus said i see uh, satan fallen on the ground <laughs> because then he cannot use your mind for you to sin david gives us a testimony of his success of the protection and victory over his enemies god is doing it for every son that is walking in purity and in de integrity and here we hear another two words, purity and integrity. If you are not walking in that, guess what? We will not have it. Proverbs 2, 7. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. He 
He stores the sound wisdom. He will give us sound wisdom. And we will walk uprightly before the Lord. Psalm 84 verse 11, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will He withhold from those who walk uprightly. But we must, we must come to the place that we can fulfill the conditions. We cannot do it ourselves, therefore we need Him. He said, I, you, you will find me in the time of, but we must actually every moment a need for God. Okay? Now he said, no good thing he will withhold. Now that word good in the complete world dictionary said, an adjective meaning good, well pleased, fruitful, morally correct, proper and convenient. He will not withhold any good from us when we walk uprightly. Proverbs 30 verse 5, every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in Him. Another word, trust. We must trust in Him. So again God gave us the conditions for Him to be our shield. And what is trust? And I was looking at uh, only in the in the English Afrikaans dictionary that says it's a conviction. Actually, I I uh, Google it to have conviction, be so convicted uh, that that God is God and that He will fulfill His word. That is faith. You know, sometimes we have more faith in what we believe as what we have faith and belief in God. That is too, a, a big difference. Then there's a, assurance. Assurance is there's no doubt. You are so assured in who God is and what He says in His Word that we read this morning. He will bring to pass if we, if we uh, uh, um, are, are obedient to the conditions that He gives us. It's dependence on Him. Is reliance on Him. It should be our foundation and to be established. You, you, it gives me this. Um, it's actually like you are, are putting in cement. <laughs> you cannot move. You are putting in cement. You are secure. You are founded. You are established in that. You cannot move. That's what the word tells us. The righteous will not be moved. So we're not going to leave this earth. Colossians 2, verse 67. <clears throat> as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord to walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. You know, when I feel a little bit down and I start with thanksgiving and the Holy Spirit lifts me up and then, then the Holy Spirit takes over. And that brings this, you know, this, this in, uh, give you energy and whatever you can think on. So, amen, that's what I want to say to the, today. <coughs> And we will proceed next week on the topic of the hedge. Uh, God bless you. And we meet next week. Bye.